and we'll have our talk um, on deep learning analysis um, by John Sosa. But before we get started, I want to give a couple slides about stuff that's been going on at CMAS. Um, and what I hear a lot from people, um, I had a short little title for what I want to talk about was, I hear a lot of now what? People get their data and they wonder what to do with it. They think often, hey, it's just a pretty picture, um, but there's a lot you can also get out of that. So um, this is the start of this whole discussion series. So I wanted to set up what we're kind of interested in doing with this. Um, the whole series is gonna last hopefully quite a while um, through the summer, next semester. Um, but we really are planning on focusing on somewhat shorter of talks um, so we can have a lot of discussion um, going on with the seminars themselves. So we'll keep them fairly short, less than half an hour, and just ask lots of questions. If you're in the chat, just go ahead, submit questions there. We can answer them as we go along or afterwards, depending on how applicable they are. Um, and if you have problems, again, like Ashley said, to the attendees, um, you can ask there as well, and she can help out with that. Um, and what we want to do with this whole seminar series is kind of to highlight resources and techniques available at CMAS and other facilities across the Ohio State campus and even possibly other places as well. Um, and we actually thought of this, doing this a little while ago, and if you were around last semester and did some of the SDM series, that was the start of it. Um, but now we're kind of accelerating the schedule slightly to hopefully do um, one of these each week while CMAS and the university is closed and then way back on campus in the digital theater actually giving these talks in person and then with the digital option like we have now. And if you guys have any kind of topics that you want to hear about, um, definitely send me an email, any of the CMAS staff, and we'll get back um, and hopefully be able to do some of those topics. So some of the topics that we're planning on doing next. Um, so this one's gonna be on image analysis um, with John Sosa on, on my part. And then next week, we're planning on doing a imaging session with Carly Goodwin on what can be done on the micro CT. Um, then I'll be back um, to turn some stuff on the Quattro eSEM with a lot of the in situ capabilities we now have available, and then going on to some of our other new capabilities um, of Cryo EM, and Yoshi will be talking about those. So, um, I always like to talk about before we get into any discussions, I like to have a disclaimer about what we're talking about. So, in this case, we're kind of talking about software. So what you want to make sure you know is know the limits of the software and what it can do. You can always have a lot of problems that come up from doing data analysis wrong um, through the software. It'll give you lots of different numbers pumped out. Just make sure you understand what's going on there and what's actually going on in the analysis. Um, if you ever have questions, you can consult with CMAS staff. We're always happy to help out with that. And for image analysis kind of stuff, Carly is putting together a user group for image analysis. So if you're really into doing some of that kind of stuff, interested in MyPAR, Aviso, Carly's a great uh, resource to talk to along with John. Um, one example that I think is a common example it likes to show is with like EDS data for um, just data analysis gone awry. So this Gitrium barium copper um, compound. Um, you see its actual weight percents um, are readily available. If you do EDS with standards, you'll be within plus or minus a few percent of those. So you get a fairly accurate result there. But then if you start using different just package softwares and assuming those results are correct from either manufacturer one, manufacturer two, you can have results that are up to 30% off. And in this case, you can see that um, what your actual analysis will be, you'll think you'll be something quite a bit different than it actually is. So we'll make sure you understand what's going on and the limits of the software and what kind of artifacts it could be introducing. Um, so as far as actual software that's available for most CMAS users, I listed 
just about everything I could find here. So we have a lot of software available for analysis of TM data, XRD, EDS, EBSD, um, along with image analysis software. Um, most of these, um, normally you have to be on site CMAS to use and be able to log into them. Um, but I know right now a lot of these are available actually free since people are working from home. Um, so if you have questions on how to access those, we definitely want people to be able to do their analysis right now. So let us know and we can try and get you access to some of these um, if you're not able to get access to any of them right now. Um, then other ones are available for free for OSU staff uh, like MyPAR. Um, I've used those generally at CMAS, um, but we do have some licenses available that we can possibly share as well. Um, so with that, just those are kind of what's available there. The majority of our talks can be given by John Sosa. Um, he's the co-founder of um, MyPAR and he runs it. He's a great resource if you ever have lots of questions. Um, he originally did his PhD here at Ohio State, um, working with Hamish Fraser, doing 2D, 3D microstructure characterization of titanium alloys. Um, and like I said, my part, it's one of the data analysis softwares for OSU users. It's freely available from the university um, from my part that way. Um, I've used it for actually some of my own analysis with some in situ experience, I found it um, pretty straightforward to actually use and get some really useful data out quickly that I used to go around in image J and take a lot longer to do. So it's really good. Um, if you haven't done it yet, there's that Udemy course on image analysis that's put together. I went around that this last week and gave a lot of extra helpful tips. So I would highly suggest looking at that as well to get a good understanding of software analysis and then um, my part actually itself. So um, I'll give this over to John and he can follow up on the rest of this. Thank you, Daniel, for the introduction. I really appreciate it. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Is the, uh, the screen share working and my voice coming through? Okay, awesome. Thank you very, very much. So as Daniel said, my name is John Sosa. I'm the CEO and co-founder here at MyPAR. Uh, I did do my degree at Ohio State, uh, all of my degrees from undergraduate through to PhD, working with Hamish Fraser there in the material science department. So today is going to focus on this new wave of tech that's made its way into many different fields, but especially image analysis that is deep learning. And it's, it's rare that you come across a, a, a technology that not only puts more challenging yet real world problems within reach, but is somehow at the same time more accessible, more easy, uh, easier to use at the same time. It's almost a too good to be true scenario on its face. But what we'll be seeing in our deployment of this is that it's, it's very much true. And, and that's what I'm gonna to show today. So uh, I wanted to get started with a quick background on my par. Yes, we did start in material science. It was invented at Ohio State. It, it was at the time and continues to be developed by actual end users of, of the product. We have skill sets in software development that have led to its uh, existence, but we are very much users of the product, perhaps more so than we are developers. And I believe that that is a big, a big reason for the nature of the product and the attention that's been placed on certain aspects of the usability without intention, I think has come from the fact that it's iteratively developed by folks who also use it for their own research and now 
their own business. We did spin out from the university. We're a private company. Now we are up here in Worthington, Ohio, about 15 minutes north of the university. Spun out in 2017 after getting some great traction, starting to do license sales out of Ohio State uh, while I was still employed there. We're now in hundreds of schools and companies around the world, uh, probably in over 40 countries, last I checked. So it's been a very exciting first uh, two and a half years. Definitely a lot uh, I didn't know I didn't know going into business. I'm more than happy to discuss ups and downs, pros and cons of spinning out as an entrepreneur with anyone who might have interest in doing that or questions. It's definitely been a exciting time for sure. And uh, let me also say, I hope everyone is safe and healthy out there. This is, you almost can't talk to anyone on the planet without acknowledging the situation. And uh, thankfully, uh, our business has been okay for the mean, for the, for the time being. It almost seems like with folks trapped behind their computer screens, they have even more time for analysis these days. So strangely, we're, we're, we're pretty busy at the moment. So uh, let me move now to just a quick map here. You see a lot of red dots. Yes, we're in many places on the world. This is probably a bit outdated now, but it's been great to see this widespread adoption in just a couple of years. So I'm not sure how many of folks have seen this comic, but I felt like it was pretty appropriate for today's focus. Again, there's, there's a ton we can talk about when it comes to image analysis, but focusing on deep learning, what, what that, what that, uh, development has allowed us to do. We rolled it out about July of last year and it has had a, it's had a profound change in the way that these, these challenging yet often very common problems tend to be approached. You know, we, we've realized, especially as we've gone out more into industry that everyone is more or less on the same page when it comes to the benefits of automation. Orders of magnitude speed improvement, uncertainty reduction, increase in objectivity, ability to measure more complicated attributes of features. But the theory never quite always matches up with reality when going after those real challenging problems. The idea is that okay, we've got this task that we do over and over again. Why not automate it? Let's put a little bit of investment in early on, develop our automated routine, and then we can move on to other things afterward. Where, especially for the tougher problems, the question quickly becomes, wait a minute, couldn't I have just done this by hand already? And that's a real uh, activation barrier that we have to acknowledge, especially with the real challenging problems that are out there. Doing nothing for automation is always uh, an option as we keep running into, just continuing business as usual, making hand annotations on images, counting cells by hand, tracing features, and then measuring them. That's very straightforward for folks to do. Who, who doesn't know how to circle things on an image? And what deep learning has allowed us to do is take those activities doing what you've been doing anyway, and just do it a little bit longer, and now have those trainings actually, have those tracings actually be used for something other than having to do them all over again the next time. Take those annotations, put them into an engine that can evolve them into an intelligent algorithm that can take over from there. So again, when you're considering a, a manual approach versus an automated approach, the benefits are obvious. But as we've seen, if these three requirements are not met, if the automated solution you get isn't as trustworthy or more than what you've been doing by hand, it's got to work for more than just one image. It's got to work under the real variations that you see from image to image, whether it's lighting and exposure differences or 
differences in sample prep conditions. It's, it's got to have a reasonable level of robustness or at least be taught to become more robust. And it can't require a CS degree to put this thing together and distribute it around the organization. It's got to be something that the folks that were already characterizing the samples using previous methods can move into and come up with a uh, approach that can be distributed to non-experts within an organization. So if you kind of consider this rudimentary axis of solutions that can range from needing a lot of experience to very little, that can offer robust solutions to, down to not very robust solutions, prior to even any graphical software products, really all we had at our disposal was hard-coded solutions, writing some C code or Visual Basic, now Python and various other things. And plenty of hard-coded solutions are done and are, and are out there. What we tend to see is more or less, they lie in a space like this, where certainly they require a good amount of experience to develop and implement. And they tend to be pretty precisely tuned for a specific problem. If they do have settings that allow you know, thresholds and other things to be adjusted. Those aren't always the most accessible settings. So they live in a space that is, is pretty tightly tuned to a certain, a certain problem condition. Where we've been able to get with my par, even prior to deep learning, was more into a realm like this, where with these visually interactively built graphical algorithms we call recipes that require no coding, We've been able to get to more robust solutions that have, you know, that are, require less experience to create than hard-coded solutions. Uh, and for simple problems, this tends to work pretty well. You don't, you, this dot moves even more to the right if the problem is pretty easy and it doesn't need to be as robust a solution. So classical recipes, as we've come to call them, can be very acceptable. However, there are still plenty of problems that live outside of this solution space. And this is where we see deep learning really making an impact where, as I said in the beginning, we somehow have a technology that gives us more robust solutions and is easier to operate at the same time. And I'm not saying we don't build classical recipes anymore. There are still solutions where they are the, the right approach but it's definitely been a paradigm shift in adopting this, this latest in machine learning tech, this deep learning. So what we're gonna do is break out to the software and take a look at this problem right here. We're going to annotate and train this thing live. Then we're gonna let it run in the background and train on the GPU, go back into the slides, cover a few more applications, and when, it's, when we're done with that, we'll check in on it and see the results. So we're gonna focus just on the tracing and the training for now. We'll come back and look at the application at the end. So let me go ahead and break out of the software here. I'm gonna bring up uh, MyPAR's deep learning trainer. And here's what we have here. So this is the deep learning trainer. The, uh, if you're familiar with MyPAR, you've got the launch bar at the top, the status bar at the bottom. And this is the environment where the deep learning models are created. So let me just one moment here. I want to periodically check in on the, on the chat. Try to keep an eye on it as best I can. Uh, we are going to have Q&A at the end. Try to save at least 20 minutes for Q&A. So I will, uh, We'll make sure to address questions that, that aren't addressed real time towards the end. <clears throat> so here in the deep learning trainer, what we'll start, we'll just take two images of that sample. By the way, if you, some of you probably recognize this microstructure, this is a titanium microstructure. It is quite challenging. The goal is to identify these boundaries. I realize I completely glossed over the problem statement in the slides. The goal is to recognize this grain structure and trace these grain boundaries such that the grains can be measured. This is a problem that uh, a week ago I still thought was impossible to automate. We've tried everything classically to recognize only these features. Our brain seems to do a fantastic job at recognizing that particular pattern, but there's no 
low intensity, grayscale intensity difference between what's on the boundaries and the interior. There, it's only this very abrupt change in local pattern, uh, typically accompanied by this, what's called grain boundary alpha, these, these stringer features along them that tells a material scientist these are grain boundaries. But it's still done purely manually today, uh, unless you use a technique like EBSD to, to measure the orientations. And, and the, the goal, especially in industry, is to automate this thing from optical microscopy. And that can have a huge impact on all sorts of, uh, of, of value uh, aspects. <clears throat> so what we're going to do here, we have two reference images loaded. And you can just start annotating right in this environment if you want to make your tracings. So we can add a layer and call it uh, boundaries. And then we can grab our pen tool and just start drawing here along the, the boundaries. But what we actually did is drop these over to an iPad and you can use any number of the annotation tools that are available. You've got markup built in. We use an app called Procreate that works very well for us. And I'm going to just go ahead and load in those tracings. Those, those tracings that you make on the iPad can be imported right in to the deep learning trainer to train from them. So I'm just going to grab those that we've made here. So there's your boundary class that's been traced. You need at least two uh, layers to train for deep learning. So if you've only traced one, then basic, the other one is going to be the inverse of that. Where, which we could call the background. We have a handy tool here next to the layer addition button that lets you add the inverse of all layers that have been drawn. So if we click that and we call this background, now you've got your two classes, your boundaries and your background. I guess maybe I'd call this interior. So we usually call it. So we've got our tracings. We're good to go. Two training images, which if you're familiar with deep learning, it should surprise you that you could get anything out of two images. Uh, we've, we've seen that we certainly can, and you'll see a little bit as to why. Uh, it, it comes partly from how we take the results of the deep learning and, and further process it into the ultimate solution. That helps us do a lot more with less training data. As far as settings, there aren't many. <clears throat> the tiling just splits the image into subfields. That not only gets, that not only reduces memory demand and gets past some memory limitations of, of GPUs, but helps also produce better results because deep learning does tend to be fairly image hungry. We've seen that you can take the same image and feed it to the training engine all at once versus splitting it up into 36 little subunits. You tend to get better results with the 36 little subunits. You can't go crazy with the splitting up because sometimes you need the spatial relationship of all the features. But uh, splitting it up at least into a two by two is, is almost always recommended. The size factor is a downsampling factor that just, again, lets you reduce the pixel density and get around some memory limitations, improve performance. But uh, for an image like this, size factor of one is perfectly fine. And then the epochs are really just a unit of duration. So 500 will run the training for longer than 100. And there's some recommendations in our manual as to what number to use for, for epochs based on how many images you have and what some of these other settings are. The processor, a GPU, is strongly recommended for training. You can train or apply models on the CPU. You usually see a 8 to 10x acceleration when running it on the GPU. So for applying, it's not that big of a deal because you're usually looking at seconds to apply a model. So if you're running it at 10 seconds on the CPU versus one second on the GPU, it's a great speed up, but it's not a deal breaker if you don't have a graphics card. Whereas training is usually minutes to hours. So with a GPU, you could take what used to take a whole work day and do it in under an hour. That becomes a pretty big deal. We have a page in our manual also on the different recommended GPU options. It does have to be an NVIDIA card. Uh, this particular workstation is running an RTX 2080 Ti that I think costs about a thousand bucks or less. So let's get it going. We'll hit train new. It's going to split the image up into the tiles and then start up the training and give us an ETA. This should take about 15 minutes or so to train. 
So we'll let that cook and then let's go back to the slides. So while that's going, we're gonna look at three other cases. The first is all three of them were chosen because they represent challenges that we tend to see across many different real world applications. We do a lot of work in materials these days, but we do tons in life science too. And a lot more even in, we're well not necessarily a lot more than materials, but a lot more than we used to be doing even a year ago in aerial imaging and drone image analysis. MIPAR is very much a general image analysis platform. There's absolutely nothing about it that's specific to materials or life science or uh, drone imagery. Those markets are we're mostly materials, primarily because that's where we advertise the most. So I'm not sure how many of the attendees are in the life science space, but I know we have a lot of, <clears throat> excuse me, life science users across the university. So I wanted to include at least one bio example. Again, all three of these embody uh, automated solutions that I really never thought I would see a solution to. In the twin grain case, you have obviously uh, a very challenging local pattern recognition problem to be able to draw boundaries around grains while ignoring these very abrupt twin boundaries. In the melt pool case, that is more and more analyzed with the uh, explosion of additive manufacturing, you've got challenging features as well. You've got subtle uh, boundaries that need to be picked up on, <clears throat> excuse me. But then there's also a measurement challenge here. This particular client wanted to measure a melt pool overlapped uh, as an aerial fraction of the, the total melt pool considering the invisible part of the melt pool that you can't see. So having to somehow reconstruct where that melt pool lies so that you can measure its overlap with its neighbor. So we'll take a look at that. And then uh, the stomata cells, <clears throat> we will take a look at that as well. This, this involves counting these hard to detect features that again have no intensity difference with the surrounding. This is a plant leaf where it's got two different types of cells, these epithelial cells here and then these stomata cells that are kind of like these two concentric footballs. Uh, absolutely no way for us to uh, find these with, with classical image analysis, at least not without introducing a bunch of false positives. So you'll see the, the deep learning solution to, to that. And again, the, these are just three out of over hundreds of applications that we and our users have tackled. They were just chosen because they're some of the hardest ones we've dealt with and they represent a lot of common challenges to these other problems. So I'm gonna move through these quickly. Uh, I wanna show you a little bit of the live software demo for each of them. I hope it's not overwhelming. I didn't wanna just do slides uh, aside from that other live demo piece. So we are gonna break out into the software and look at each of these solutions, but I recognize that uh, we wanna leave plenty of time for questions. So I'm gonna to try to get through all three of these in uh, at most another 15 minutes total. So again, this is, this is a twin grain detection problem. I'd say it's easier to find the twins than it is the grains in this case. I mean, the twins are these stripe-like features. And folks that are uh, familiar with this microstructure know that you've got to do some mental gymnastics in the background to piece together these multiple parallel strips into something that amounts to a grain shape. And we couldn't come close to doing that with classical approaches. So this particular client resorted to uh, <clears throat> manually tracing every one of their uh, images so that they could get a full grain size distribution. So they had archived tracings and they were used to doing that. So the other thing I should mention is that all three of these cases that I'm going to show you use a slightly different approach to generating the manual annotations. And I, that's another reason why they were each chosen. In this case, we have tracings that were already available from historical work. So you're able to take those, import them in, train on them immediately, and get a result. 
So let's take a look. Let's go back out into the software. And back over in here, I'm going to grab one of the train case, one of the cases here. This is the image processor now. This is where individual images are, are processed and, and where recipes are uh, built and created. So what I'm going to first do is load in what used to be our state of the art, the best we could do with a classical recipe without deep learning. We just drag in the RCP file to load. Let's reduce the thickness on that outline. And that's what we got. So we it used a combination of edge find filters and some noise reduction, artifact rejection. We tried to absorb some of the highly eccentric twins into their parent grains. But by and large, anything that has an abrupt boundary got picked up on as a boundary. And I guess that's great if you want to measure total boundary fraction, but it doesn't do anything for you if you want to get grain size without the twins. So again, we used the uh, we used the tracings that were available on a series of training images, trained up a model, and then built a recipe around it. And you'll see a little bit more of what I mean by build a recipe around it when we process the, the test case that we're training in the background here. So now I'm going to load in the recipe using deep learning. And we almost fell out of our chairs when we saw this result. The blue grains are edge grains that uh, that are they're, you know they're, they're partial grains so for the purpose of uh, measurement we choose to ignore them the red grains are what's measured here in a for their mean size <clears throat> uh, this was a training image so this was part of the train set a and while it, I think it's still impressive to be able to effectively recreate what you had traced usually the real test comes from running the, the model on an image that uh, it had never seen before that was not part of the training set. And we'll make sure to, to look at that as well. Uh, real quick, this is set up with the ability to make easy corrections. Since there are gonna be some corrections you might wanna make. So for instance, if you wanted to add, oh, it looks like our training is done. We'll get back to that. If you wanted to add a boundary here that was missed the way this recipe is presented. Uh, right now it's in simple mode, so you're only seeing the key steps that have been exposed. If you unlock this, then you really see the full sequence of steps that have been done, but we're not gonna dive into that right now. So this is the only one that has been flagged, which is why it's the only one that you see here in simple mode. If you click edit on this and we just, uh, not erase, but drew in a line here. You don't have to be perfect, just draw a line like that. Click accept, my par will fill it in and clean it up for you. If there's a boundary you want to remove, like this guy up here, then do the same thing in erase mode, just cross it out and the whole thing goes away. So you can quickly make changes, fix it up and rerun the measurements. They haven't changed at all. And then you can, if you want, use your corrected images and retrain the model in a second iteration based on your fixes. Measurement wise, you saw that, you saw the mean grain size be measured. If you wanna look at a distribution, push play. Here's a distribution of the grain sizes, color coded to match between histogram and image. There's nice connectivity here between all three graphics. So if we sort here by size, we click a cell, it highlights that grain in the image. We can also show it on the histogram. So we can march down the histogram here. It works the other way. So you click a grain, that cell gets highlighted. You can make formatting changes to all of this. If you wanna change the color map to something else, you wanna change the limits maybe, you wanna adjust the binning here, or maybe even set specific bin endpoints. All of that that you do, you click save, all of those configurations get saved back into this measurement step. So the next time you or colleague hit play, all of that comes right back for you. And I'm not, it, it's not, it's not really used too often in academia, but we have a report generator where if you hit print report, 
generate, then all of these graphics get thrown into a nicely formatted Word document. This template, this Word template lives in the installation directory, so you can make more customizations, add your own logo and so on. Uh, and it is a nice way to, to quickly present results without having to do much work. And it, you'll see this print report button throughout, whether it's taking a distribution and, and making a report or taking a global measurement and just making a simple report out of that. There's various places where you can generate uh, nice formal reports that can be, of course, saved out to a PDF. So uh, that is that is the processing of this example. I don't uh, know that I have much time to go into batch processing, but just know that it's possible. What I can do is very quickly queue up a batch process. So we launch the batch processor. I will bring in all four images that we have for this example, click process, and it'll now batch apply the recipe to all of those. When it's done, you can hit view results and that'll open up everything in the purple application, the post processor. This is a nice environment for you to review the results of a batch. So you can click through and see how each image was detected. If you need to make changes, you can, and then you can regenerate measurements. You've got the ability to then also aggregate measurements across different fields. So if you wanted to make a total grain size distribution by lumping all red grains from all four images into one plot, then we can do that here. And this has actually helped users avoid the need to stitch multiple fields together because they can just throw all of their stats into one distribution. So this is all grains across all four right here. And lastly, this image that we're on right here is a test image and was in no way part of the training set. And this kind of performance is exactly what you want to see from a test case to know that the model has learned uh, to look outside the training set. I mean, any model is still going to need to see the potential variation that you want it to accommodate. So you definitely want to hand it the extreme cases of your application. Make sure you hand it the spread in exposure and prep conditions you might encounter. But uh, it certainly is able to be trained to a point where it works well on images that it never saw before. Okay, let's go back to the slides and move on to the next case. We're going to look now at the melt pool case. We're not going to focus as much on the segmentation because it was done much the same way, except to show that in this case, the training was done in a semi-automated fashion. Because, whoops, I think it's important that that is uh, clarified. So uh, let's move right out into the software and demo this thing. In this case, if we grab the uh, one of the training images here, yeah, this is what we trained on, just one image. What, what we did is we built a recipe that got, I'd say 80, 85% of the features, the classical recipe here, made a bunch of mistakes, but then we can go in and edit this and cross out all of these mistakes. I won't do all of them. I think you get the idea. Something like that. Usually do it a couple times, click accept, see all those errors go away, find some ones that you missed, like this guy needs to be added in here, add that in. And much quicker than you could painstakingly trace every single one of these, you can develop a training set for yourself by using the semi-automated approach. So now you could click save all layers and that would save out both layers here, pools and interior, put those into the deep learning trainer, train on them and be off to the races with that semi-automated workflow. So let's show here the result now of what we got after we trained it and built the recipe around it. Well, that's on the that's on the training set. I'm not sure where those guys went, to be honest. 
Let's run it actually on a test image. This was one that the, the training had never actually seen. And that's the result that we got there. And I wanted to then just demonstrate a, a very customized measurement approach that we had put together for this thing. If we now drag in this one, what it does is after it detects the pools down here, it pops up and pauses on an interactive window where you can pick a particular pool to measure. So this is the workflow that this user wanted. They wanted to be able to spot check different pools and measure their overlap. So pick a pool, say accept. It's now gonna continue through. And what it's gonna do is take that pool, try to estimate what its axis of symmetry is, mirror the right half over that axis, calculate the bit that extends past that particular pool and then measure the red area as a percentage of this entire hull and call that the overlap percentage and also give you the di dimensions of that reconstructed pool. So then if you wanted to pick another one, maybe you wanted to look at this one down here, pick that pool, it'll run through again, do the estimation, show you the projected position, measure that overlap percentage. This one's a little smaller here at 20%. And then lastly, we could move up and do, pick one of these heavily overlapped ones. And we see this guy here sits with more than a 50% overlap. So a very specific measurement structure, obviously, but one that with the power of the, the graphical recipe development, almost the, the graphical programming you can do in my part, we're able to put that entire application, it's basically an application for measuring melt pool overlap, we're able to build that in under an hour for this, this particular user. Okay, so I know that was real quick, uh, but this is a, this will be a, a, a nice way to finish before we look at the results of our live training. We'll look at the somatocell example. This was what I call a third approach to training where it was more of a, just a quick and dirty. We're able to just trace up, uh, we're able to just you know, put ellipses or boxes around the somatocells that we wanted to find in the deep learning trainer and uh, develop a model that way. This one did use, I think, 24 images to train, and we split each one up into a five by five grid, so you had 600 sub-images total. I'm not gonna run that, but if you took a look at how that uh, was to develop, let's not ruin that one, let's go to the other one here. If we're able to take one of these stomata images, I think this is one of the ones that we used for tracing, uh, we were able to just make a layer, call it cells. And then we used our ellipse tool here to just put circles around these cell features. So we did that for 20, 20 or so images uh, trained and then got this result. So let me show you that result. Actually run it on a test image here now. And we just drag in the recipe. And this will let you see kind of how we take a deep learning model and further process it. So that's the result there. It finds these these cells that, trust me, we could not do in a semi automated without, with classical approaches. I mean, there's, there's cases where you run this again, let's reload it. We even find these cells when they're hidden behind these, whatever the heck this string is in the image. I mean, I, just, if you've spent time with classical image processing, you would just they're, they're almost, there's, there's not much you can say about, I mean, come on, that's, it's, it's, it's impressive tech that we did not build. I mean, understand we did not invent deep learning. We did not make this particular convolutional neural net structure. We're fortunate enough to be able to use these tools and deploy them in a way that they're accessible to people without having to write any code. That's really all that we did here. So uh, what this actually is doing, if you unlock the recipe, the first thing that the recipe does is take the deep learning model and apply it. So when you apply a deep learning model, this is what you tend to get. It's called a probability map. And it indicates pixels as bright if they're most likely to belong to the class of interest. 
there's two classes here, stomata and background. So you actually get two probability maps. So we take the stomata probability map that lights up the pixels that are likely to belong to those cells. And then we further process this. We still wanna give you the flexibility to take what the deep learning gives you and turn it into the ultimate solution that can also have customizations that your problem needs. Like maybe you wanna set a minimum cell size or you wanna ignore ones that touch the edge or you don't wanna count ones that are too eccentric. We're not trying to force you to just take the deep learning and, and run with it but give you the flexibility to further process it uh, and, and basically shift your starting point from this image to this image. And it, it's almost been a way to normalize most image analysis problems and always start with a condition where you've got bright things on a dark background, which any image analyst would like to start with. So what we did there is we, we selected the uh, features that or the pixels that were above a certain probability threshold, rejected artifacts, replaced these with a box because we wanted to show boxes as, as, as the detection objects, removed things that were on the edge and then ignored bits under a certain size. And that's it. So that's how the recipe is built around a deep learning model. So uh, let's go back then and just finish up by looking at our training that we started in the beginning. So what's going on here is, whoop, you jump out and take a look at this. What we would do here, this is done. So we'd hit save model and we would go and save this model somewhere. You could also have clicked uh, save and a, this drop down initially would have said save and apply so that would save it and then auto launch this image into the image processor auto load the model in and show you the result but you could also just do it the the way i'm doing it now by saving that model out let's go now and grab the uh, one of the test images here and then we can just drag the model file in here, and that will also open it up and show us the result. So here is the boundaries lit up, most likely to belong to the grain boundaries. So we would accept that and then build the rest of our steps. And the rest of our steps would look something like this here. We also measuring grain size here, ASTM grain size, E112 standard. But those steps are broken up into chapters in this case. So you've got groups of steps. So this here is where we select, I'll switch to binary. So we go from the very beginning, we go from the probability map to this here. At, well, let's remove this. So you can just see the end point where we're finding all the boundaries. So you can think of as going from the computer prediction here down to the final result, what the rest of these chapters do for us. This one here just selects, again, a probability threshold. We remove artifacts. We connect the missing boundaries. And then we thin everything down to a single pixel line. And that becomes our innovation. Uh, but now let's run it on one that was not part of the training set at all. This one here. And even with these deep scratches in this case, and very challenging boundaries like this, on a test image, it does remarkably well on a training that we did during the course of the webinar. So we're, we're very excited about this tech. We've seen it do remarkable things. We're really excited to see what uh, the commercial space and academia do with it. Again, it's that rare case where you've got even more powerful tools that are accessible to, to more people. Uh, so we're, we're really happy to, to have the whole OSU community have access to this. And that's kind of where I wanted to finish before we move on to the Q&A. 
So, uh, you know, like I said, we handle all sorts of problems across materials, life science, even aerial imaging. Whether you want to break up in the material space, you want to break up the solutions by the type of problem, or you want to break it out by material type, it just depends on how you classify your problem. On the life science side, we do a whole host of, of different applications. And then I, I don't list the aerial applications, but, but we're doing more of those too. So if you're interested in, in learning more or getting your hands on the tools, visit our website. The applications page has a nice interactive tabs table to show you the different problems that we solve in these different fields of study. As Daniel mentioned, we have our MyPAR Academy, as we call it, which is a free self-paced Udemy course that walks you through about five hours of content. There's not much deep learning stuff up there now. It was built before it launched. So it's much more about classical approaches, morphological image processing, being able to creatively string basic steps together into powerful algorithms. But it still has application to the deep learning side because it, it it can still be the, the stuff that you do after the deep learning model. And you'll still get a solid skill set for how to do that uh, post-processing of, of the deep learning probability map uh, using, using the, 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 the skills that are shown here in this course. You're always welcome to shoot us an email or give us a call. Students and staff at Ohio State all have free MyPAR access. If you're in the College of Engineering, you can request access to the license at this ETS portal. We are working tirelessly to get the OCIO to host a full university-wide site license. It's a long time in the making, but we're almost there. For now, if you're outside the COE and you need a license, either shoot us an email or you can shoot CMAS an email and they'll redirect and gather inquiries over to us and we can get you licenses. Uh, if you're outside the COE. And, and also when folks are working from home during this crisis, you probably, I believe you can VPN into the COE license and use it off campus, but if you can't, or you, you'd still like one for your local machine, use the same pathway, send us an email or, or talk to CMAS and, and we'll get you uh, a free license for, for your system if you can't access the COE site license. I'm not sure if anyone else is tuning in outside of Ohio State, but uh, you, Trials are available, trial licenses are available at, at, at this site. Uh, and we likely may be launching a, a program to get students, especially during this, this period where everyone is home and, and in a crisis, we're, we're, we're looking at a program here to, to get students OSU type access to, to the, the software, uh, at least for a period of time. 